My guest today is Gary Short. Gary, how are you, sir? I'm very well, thank you, Dave. Yourself? I'm doing great. You're looking good. I like the beard. I didn't, you didn't have that last time I saw you. In oh, person. that's all uh, lockdown fuzz. That's what that is. <laughs> that's all well, uh, quar quarantine nonsense. Looks good on you. Uh, <laughs> tell me, <laughs> tell me, Gary. Actually, I know this answer this question, but uh, but they don't. What do you do for a living? Oh, that's a really so, so that's a really difficult one actually. So what I do for a living is actually quite complicated. But I guess the elevator pitch I would give these days, you know, um, if I if I had to sum it up in a sentence, basically what I do is I create internet scale infrastructure and I build teams and then I use them to predict the future. Wow, that sounds powerful. That is it. It, it can be. I mean, it's a powerful tool. It doesn't necessarily, you know, just because you've got a powerful tool doesn't necessarily mean to say you use it to do powerful things. You got a powerful yes, mind it's, behind it. <laughs> it's a, it, it. It can give you a very powerful tool. You know, if you're a retailer, for example, then you've got, you know, you've got an internet scale analytics infrastructure and a good team behind it to service that, plus the service wrap that goes around that. You know, it's not just a case of, well, over here, we've got our analytics infrastructure and we've got our data science team and actually if you look if you open the door a little bit they all look a little bit scary and nobody really wants to go anywhere near them you know you need the service wrap around that so that other parts of the organization can actually engage with that team otherwise the tool is useless to you you Got know it. Um, yeah and so it's that it's that whole thing in combination. It's the infrastructure, it's the data science team, and it's a service wrap that goes all the way around it. And I provide that kind of consultancy for for well anyone who will pay me. To be fair, <laughs> uh, well, predicting the future is uh, has been really hard recently. I mean, 2020 threw us a curveball, mostly because of COVID-19. Uh, it affected every part of our lives: the economy, our lifestyle, our entertainment, our travel. You and I used to travel right. a lot, and now I'm not traveling at all. No, me, um, me neither. And that's a, uh, that's actually a really good point when it comes to prediction. It's it's one of these things. Um, it's a bit like quantum mechanics. You know, some things are very easy to predict, um, but the when is really difficult. So you know, when people say, "Oh, nobody saw the pandemic coming," that's not true. Literally, hundreds of people saw the pandemic coming, but they just didn't really know when it was going to arrive. You know, everybody could kind of see that this kind of thing was going to bubble up and, and we had things like swine flu and we had bird flu and all of those kind of things. And people way back then were even saying, you know, if this if this is a, a really infectious disease that really hits humans hard, you know, this could be a global pandemic and, and present us with a real problem. And, and politicians and other people would say, well, when's that likely to happen? You know, we go, well, we don't know because, you know, it's a mutating virus, but we are saying, if this, you know, we're going to say that this is bound to happen sometime in the future. It's just bound to, but but we don't know, but we don't know when. So that's the hard thing about prediction. Some things are easy to predict, but not very easy to predict when they'll happen. And obviously, the um, uh, you know, the opposite is also true. Some things are really easy to predict when they will happen, but usually it's um, you know, like for example, predicting the weather tomorrow. Statistically, there's a seventy-five percent chance that tomorrow's weather is going to be like today's. That's it, really. I mean, pretty much look out your window, see today's weather, tomorrow, pretty much going to look like that, right? Okay. But that's not really that's not really helpful if you're a farmer, right. you know. If you're you saying, well, you will exactly, you know. I mean, be, you being able to tell me what the weather's like tomorrow doesn't help me because I've got to. I, I need time to do things like so flood flood pre prevention and things like that. Oh, you know, so if next week telling, or next month's weather would be much more right. Possible. Exactly, you've got to be able to do something, right? So being able to tell people who are responsible for the roads that oh it's going to flood tomorrow it's like well great what what do you expect me to do about that right so those are the two things and then of course there are some things which are just really difficult to predict if they'll happen or not and and when so there's, there's kind of those three camps there but COVID is a really good example of something that was quite easy to predict that it would happen just not just I don't think anybody saw it coming in 2020. Mm. Uh, you were telling me some things about the numbers around uh COVID, it's uh, it's a lot of people throwing out numbers, numbers of tests, numbers of cases, uh, percentages right. of uh, people that have got sick, got died, uh, 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 people that have recovered. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of data out there, but how much information is there and how useful is that data? 
Right, and that's and that's the difference, and that's the difference. Uh, it's the difference between um, data and information. You yeah. know, there's lots and lots of data, but lots of people don't necessarily 100%, especially uh, lay people um, who are just reading the paper or, or watching the news, don't necessarily understand what information that's telling them. Uh, and sometimes it, uh, the data could be quite tricky. It looks like it's telling you something um, really important, sometimes something really bad, but when you actually stop to think about what it's actually, the, the information contained in that data, then then it's not really as bad as, as you first would believe. But okay. you have to really understand what, what the difference between the data and, and the information is. But before we get into that, I want to talk about um, the, the person in the title, the, the hero that you people have, uh, that most people have never heard of. The and that is good, that's a good lead into the numbers. So the hero of COVID-19 um, and the person that you've probably never heard of is a chap by the name of uh, William Farr. So that's what William spelt, spent, spelt normally F-A-R-R. -R. Now, he worked, did most of, most of his work in the 1830s to 1850s. And um, there was there was an organisation at that time in the UK called the General Records Office, and they did pretty much e exactly what it says on the tin. They did general records for the whole of the UK. So it's things like births, deaths and marriages. Um, they were also the organisation responsible for the um, census and things like that. And in fact, um, William Farr joined the General Records Office um, in, in 1840. Well, he joined a little bit earlier than that, but in order to help them f with the 1841 census uh, in the UK. It did such a good job doing that, that that they kept him on afterwards. And actually they kept him on, and I'm just going to read this to get his name, to get the, to get the uh, position absolutely correct. Um, he was uh, responsible, here we go, Farr was responsible for the collection of official medical statistics in England and Wales. Okay. Um, so that's what he did. He was basically the first national statistician before they even called them statisticians in his um, in his actual job title, his actual job title, which is great, actually. It sounds really cool. It sounds like a real, you know, 1830s type job title. He was known as the compiler of scientific abstracts was his official job title. So how how cool is that? Oh, that's the so title William, I want on my business <laughs> oh, yeah, card. <laughs> but, but William Farr had um, what he did and the impact that had on COVID and why he's the the unsung hero of, of COVID-19, he, he made two great contributions to medical statistics. First was, it was he who decided in the UK to start um, recording the um, the reason for death, the cause of death on death oh. certificates. Before that point, the fact that you had died, the fact that you were born, you got married and you died was recorded. And that was all, right? Hmm. So just the, just the fact of of your death and and where it occurred, or in which parish it occurred, was all that was recorded. And what William Farr decided to do was to record the cause of death, and that allowed him to compile different statistics about how dangerous or the mortality rates between different um, occupations, for example, you know, between miners and and hackney cab horse drivers in London and things like that, you know, mm. um, what is the difference in mortality? So that kind of thing really helps us uh, in COVID-19 when we start talking about, well, it's far more dangerous to be a nurse, which is not hugely surprising, um, than it is to be a park ranger, for example, you know, those mm. kind of things. And bus drivers are more at risk. You know, we, we kind of know these kind of things and it's important to understand which segments of the population are at risk, which occupations, especially as lockdown starts to, to lift, and we start to get back into opening up the economy and getting the, the economy going again, it's very important that we understand which sectors of the economy are, more, are at more risk than others, because that's where we're going to focus our um, COVID security for the want of a better word. You know, mm -hmm. if, you, if you work in an office um, and it's well spaced out, it's probably not that bad. Right. But if you are a bus driver on a bus and you're confined in there and you have to engage with all the passengers as they come in and your bus is a closed box, basically you're rebreathing everybody's air all day, then you need more protection. And mm -hmm. so that that was the thing that William Farr brought, you know, the idea that what your cause of death was. 
Oh, sure. And or geography as well. If you live in the, an isolated part of the Scotland, for example, you're probably less at risk than if you live in downtown London. Right. right. It'd be nice to have numbers to back that up. Right, exactly. And the other big thing that William Farr um, discovered was a thing called um, Farr's Law. Well, obviously the, the law is named after him because because he he created it. But it seems was this fair. idea. It's this seems fair. But it's this idea that um, you know there's the there's the exponential increase in infection rates uh, as an as an epidemic becomes a pandemic and it takes off. Uh, it rises exponentially. So. The thing that they call the R rate, how many people you infect, you know, you you may infect. So with an R number of two, it means that everybody with the disease infects two more people. Right. And so if you start off at the top of a page with one person and then the next row down, you put two people. Every row down is double the number of the row above. Mm -hmm. So you get that exponential growth. Well, he also discovered that once the the virus has run its course, i.e. it's infected everybody that it can infect, it also drops off Makes sense. really quickly, right? So you basically get that bell curve effect where it ramps up really fast and then it saturates everybody that it can infect and then it ramps down really quickly as well. And you get this idea of a really high peaked bell curve. OK, mm -hmm. so that idea is called Farr's law. And when you hear about COVID-19 and people and politicians especially are talking about these are the steps that we have to put in place to flatten the curve. It's FARS curve that they're talking about, all right? It's this idea of a really high peaked curve up really quick and then down really quick. What they're trying to do by flatten the curve is to make that peak lower. And obviously the lower the peak is, the flatter the curve, the less people have been infected and therefore the less people are going to die. So that's the that's the two main things. Why he's the, the unsung hero, the hero of COVID-19 that you've never heard anything about. This idea of flattening the curve, that curve is his. And this idea of knowing which parts of the economy need more protection than others when you open up is also something that he introduced with this idea of recording what people's occupations were. So before we get into that kind of leads us nicely in into the numbers. Oh yeah, so we've got a couple of centuries uh, since William Farr worked. Uh, let's see, he died in 1883 and then uh, and uh, we have the benefit of his work plus everything that's come after that. Are, are we, yeah, how are we doing? Come after that. I mean, he was he was d down there um, amongst the the founding fathers of medical statistics, right. and his medical his medical statistics plays a, a massive part in our response to COVID nineteen. Obviously, um, and and to a certain extent, a kind of hidden part. I mean, obviously, you know, the the medical intervention part plays a massive part, and and but that's visible. You know, nurses and doctors and hospitals and people on ventilators and things like that, that that's visible. But actually behind the scenes, the medical statistics, medical statisticians and the statistics behind it plays a, a major part in how quickly we can recover and actually stopping things like stopping second waves, making sure the second wave isn't um, as bad as the first, um, making sure we're prepared, making sure we lock down quickly when we understand, you know, this, this kind of idea that of, of a local lockdown. Instead of saying, well, the US is shut, or you know Michigan is closed you know you can actually say well actually we'll have a local lockdown there is uh there's an outbreak in, in Dearborn for example so we're just going to lock down there right um those kind of things are only possible because of of uh, medical statisticians like William Farr who actually know and, and understand what the numbers are telling them and know that things are ramping up and here we have to lock down but actually the, the rest of Michigan is fine you know so it's, it's those kind of things and that to, to a certain extent is, is hidden but just as important as the more visible medical interventions. Hmm. Uh, so it sounds like we are using this data and the ideas of fire pretty well today. Is that a fair for, statement? For sure. Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, absolutely. And that kind of takes us nicely into the, the, the numbers and what, what they might mean and the kind of things that that you need to think about. So one of the one of the first things that I want to talk about is the absolute numbers and are they useful in any way? Um, so, for example, I'm I'm looking at the um, coronavirus world statistics at the minute, and I see the top five countries in terms of of absolute number of deaths is the US, followed by Brazil, followed by India, followed by Russia, followed by South Africa. Hmm. And you ask yourself. Is that is that number helpful in any way? You know that absolute number. 
Yeah, and I was, uh, I'm surprised to see South Africa on that list because those other countries have a lot of people. And, uh, I don't think South Africa has nearly the population of uh, uh, the U.S. and probably India not, but and Russia. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, so th so there's a bunch of things around those numbers. So firstly is is how much do you trust those numbers, hmm. right? I mean, how they're all they're how, all self-reported. I think correct. They're all self-reporting, right? So, so for a start, the, the the numbers. So when you look at these numbers, you have to take a bunch of things into consideration. Is is the difference between what's information and what's data? So the absolute numbers is is data, but the information that goes around that is well, you know, Russia, Russia are are reporting are reporting um, like just under sixteen thousand deaths. Do we? believe that um you know and you know you have to think to yourself does does russia have a history of covering up things like that um, Good question and and even if your answer to that is i tr i trust the numbers right so so even if you do trust the numbers you may say yeah i trust the numbers you know th these guys are, are good guys so take india for example you say yep those guys are good guys i i don't see that, that they necessarily have a a history of propaganda or wanting to cover things up. I totally trust their numbers. Then you've got to ask yourself, well, yes, but how capable are they of measuring that number? I mean, if you think of some of the poor villages in, in India, not necessarily villages which are poor, but villages which are rural uh, mm -hmm. in, in nature. I mean, the people there might not be starving necessarily. They might not necessarily be living hand to mouth. They might be, you know, in, in terms of village, rural villagers, you know, quite wealthy. Um, but they just live a very long way away. Um, you know, are we really going out and, and checking these things? Okay. So that, that's one thing to look at the the overall number. So, but in general, absolute numbers don't really help us except for one thing: what the absolute. So they don't allow us to compare. So, for example, we can't pay. We can't prepare. We can't compare. Sorry, the something like what is it right now? Seven hundred and seventy-seven thousand deaths in the U.S. Right? We can't compare that with Brazil, say. Right? Their number yeah. because I think it's one hundred seventy-seven thousand. Eh, sorry, I was I misread that. I was looking at the world death toll there. Yeah. Sorry, I misread that line. So it's seven hundred. It's it's seven hundred and seventy-seven thousand globally. I do beg your pardon. I read I read the the wrong line there. It's one hundred and seventy-four thousand for uh, for the US. Um, so you can't take that one hundred and seventy-four thousand and compare it with Russia or with India or, or with Brazil. You, know, you can't compare the absolute number. You have to do things like um, look at the number of deaths per million to actually to actually do a meaningful comparison. So the only real thing that um, absolute numbers help us with, and that's even once we've kind of said, well, do we believe that number? And we take all that in consideration. The only real thing it helps us do is to put it into historical context. That's the only thing the absolute number helps us do. So for example, more US citizens have now died in the COVID-19 pandemic than, than soldiers who died in the Vietnam War, for example. Okay. All right. So it does nothing other than allow us to put it into a historical context. OK, um, and if we want to compare, then we have to start doing things like uh, uh, deaths per million of population. Okay? That seems so like a significant kind of number. Control. How likely exactly. am I to die given that I live in the US? It, exactly. So so that is another thing. It's, it's what is your what what is you what is the the um, mortality rate? So globally, the mortality rate for COVID-19 is uh, around 3.5%. So around 3.5% of people who get the virus will die. Now that doesn't necessarily mean to say, um, and that's so that's another thing. So when you look at that number, you think, well, that's fine. You know, that's that's not really a lot. If I get COVID-19, then 3.5% chance of dying is is not great. It means I've got a 96.5% chance of pulling through. So, and the trouble with with that kind of stuff, the, the the trouble with that number, and again, you know, it's it's always good to separate the information from the data. Again, that's an absolute number. That's generally across the population. And the trouble with that kind of thinking, where you say, if I get COVID 19, I've only got a 3.5% chance of dying. That isn't true because the rate is not constant throughout the population. Okay. Um, 
here there's been work done in the in the UK which says for uh, up to a particular level, and I can't remember that number off the top of my head, your kind of risk is about the, the same. I, I want to say between 35 and 40, right? Maybe a little bit more. Um, then your risk is, is relatively low. It's in that 3.5%. But for every five years above that, then your risk doubles, right? So whilst you, if you contracted COVID-19, may only have a 3.5% chance of of um, dying from the disease. The little old lady that you're sitting next to on the bus or sitting in front of or sitting behind on the bus, she has a much, much higher rate, a much higher chance of dying. And it's these people you have to think about, right? It's not a case of, well, I'm going to go down to the pub today or I'm going to go to the bar. I'm going to stand outside and congregate in with dozens and dozens of people. You know, I'm going to go on spring break like nothing happened, right? Because I'm okay. Yes, you probably will be if you are the younger generation, if you're, and definitely, definitely if you're the kind of college um, population, you know, you right. are very, very unlikely to succumb to COVID-19. But you go visit grandma. But your granny, and, absolutely. And you're putting right? at risk, at great and risk. That's, yeah, and that's, um, that and actually that's one of the positives to take from COVID-19. It's actually one of the positives. Although you can always point at, at small numbers of exceptions where younger people have behaved really stupidly, those actually are a tiny, tiny minority of that generation. So one of the positives to take from COVID-19 is that you have a generation of people who have next to no risk of any harm coming to them, COVID-19, are for the most part buttoning down and going, yes, I will take one for the team. I will lock down. I will social distance. I won't go to the pub. I will wear my mask out in public. That's encouraging. Even though, even though they personally have next to no chance of having any ill effects, right? right. There's still a generation willing to take one for the team. And before COVID-19, actually, you could probably speak to people of my generation, you know, your generation and, and like older people um, who probably had nothing good necessarily to say about millennials and younger people. You know, it was like, oh, yeah, well, back in my day, blah, 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 blah. And you, you know, the usual thing. Actually, yeah. we've had to we've had to sit back and go, do you know what? Those guys, the millennials and the generation Zers or whatever comes after them. They've they've done all right. You know, they've they've kind of they've taken one for the team. They've kind of surprised us. So that's a, that is a positive to take um, out of COVID-19. So that's that's um, one set of numbers to kind of understand the difference between information and data. And the other one is testing. Testing is one of these things where it's very difficult to misunderstand what it is that you've been told. It's what it, it's what I call and this is just a term that, that, that I use it. It doesn't mean anything to anybody else apart from me. So I'll explain it. Testing is what I call soft evidence. Okay. Right. And I'll go on to, to talk about hard evidence in a, in a minute and things that you should be looking at if, if you um, want to know whether things are getting better or worse. But testing is one of these, is one of these things which is soft evidence because it doesn't tell you what you think it does. All right. So, and here's, I can't believe I'm going to do this. It's where President Trump is kind of right. right? I mean, he is, he is wrong in the overall sense of what he's saying, but he's kind of right in, in how he gets there. So where he's right is he says, we find, we find more cases of COVID-19 because we do more tests than anyone else in the world. Now, there's a debate about whether that is true or not, whether you do actually do more tests per head of population than anywhere else in the world. But for the sake of argument, assume that is true. His argument is we find more cases because we do more testing, right? Okay. And that statement, that very caveated statement of we find more cases because we do more testing is correct because you can't find a case if you don't do testing, right? If you correct. don't test anybody, you can't find a case. Now, what he, what he then goes on to kind of um, say and imply is that and therefore, COVID-19 isn't as bad in the US as, as it looks. No, it is, right? The difference is that 
you actually know it's bad because you're testing, you're finding people, you know it's bad. If you didn't do any testing, you wouldn't find people. But guess what? Those people who have COVID-19 today would still have COVID-19 whether you tested or not, right? right? So it isn't a reflection, isn't a reflection of the presence of COVID-19 in the country. It's more a reflection of your surveillance of the disease in your country, mm -hmm. right? Um, it doesn't make the prevalence. So the, the prevalence of a disease is what percentage of the population have it at any moment in time, right? So testing doesn't change in any way the prevalence of the disease in your country, right? Or anybody's country for right. that point of view, right? The prevalence is whatever it is. All testing does is tell you whether you know what the prevalence is or not. Or whether you just go, oh, yeah. I don't know. Somebody and then says, you have hey, an opportunity the... to do something with that data, as Correct. which I learned from William Farr. Right, exactly, which you went learned from William Farr. And the other side of that, and the other side of the testing is incidence. It's all. It's also good to know um, what the incidence is. So the difference between prevalence and incidence is prevalence is what is the percentage of the people in your population who have a disease at this point in time. So say today, right? We're going to test if you could, right? You're going to test. Everybody in the US today, right? And you go that percentage of people who are positive, right? That's the prevalence of the disease in your country. The incidence is how many did we add today? What is the difference between today's number and yesterday's number, right? Mm -hmm. And if it's gone up, the incidence is increased. And if it goes down, the incidence is, is decreased. If you want to look at it in purely financial terms, um, the difference between prevalence and incidence is like prevalence is like the debt. An incidence is like the deficit. How much are you adding to your debt or subtracting from it every day? Okay. Yeah. So or so, income income versus wealth. Exactly. Yeah. yeah that, that. Yeah. That. That kind of thing. So but President Trump is kind of right when he says you find more cases because you test more. That's true. But the rest of it is is nonsense. It doesn't mean that you've got more or less COVID nineteen. You still had what you have, right? You right. just you just don't know about it. But the trouble and why I why I say testing is a soft it is a piece of soft evidence, right? Is because it's malleable, right? So the kind of things that I'm talking about is if if you have what, what we call case hunting, right? So case hunting. So if you see if you see your um, testing going up, right, and you see more positive tests. So if you if you test at one level and your rate of positive tests is say is say for the sake of of argument 3%, right? Um, and then you double your testing. If the positive rate is still 3%, then things are not getting worse. Your overall number of people of positive cases has doubled, right? But actually the percentage hasn't gone up. So the disease isn't getting any any worse in your in your country or, or where you're looking, right? So just because you see um, the number of positive cases going up, that on its own, that number, the, again, the difference between data and information, just because you see the number of positive cases going up doesn't necessarily mean to say that the disease is starting to tick up again, right? You could just be testing more, right? It's that what is the rate, what is the rate of positive tests? Has it stayed at 3% regardless of how much testing you're doing? Now, what case hunting looks like is, so here in the northwest of England right now, we, we have a, a local breakout. Right, so we have a, a a a local kind of second wave, just kind of confined around the the, the major city of of Manchester. Mm. Now, lots of testing is being done there, right? And the positive rate has risen, right? Because, but obviously, because they are testing in a known COVID hotspot, right. right? So again, just because, and of course, those are then added to the overall national score. So again, if you're looking at that and you see testing going up, but actually, oh, oh, the positive rate has actually gone up. Right, it's no longer three percent; it's now six percent. Ooh, that looks like the disease is taking off. It, it that doesn't necessarily mean that at all. What it what it means, what it meant in this case was we went looking for it. Right, we were what's called case hunting. We went to known area um, of of high COVID nineteen incidents, and we tested it. And literally in that area, they've gone door to door, right, and gone here, COVID nineteen test door to door, everybody, right. Mm. And so, of course the number of positive cases goes up okay so that's why that's why again it's it's soft because it's malleable another reason why i say it's soft is no one knows what the what the type 2 error rate is with these tests now type the type two error? 
So uh, the difference between a type one error and a type two error is a type one error is a false positive. Right? It's like saying to me, Gary, you're pregnant, right? Oh. I'm not. OK, and a type two error is a false negative. Right? So it's like saying to a woman who's nine months pregnant, you're not pregnant. Got it. Yes, I am. OK, so those are type one and type two errors. Now, no one knows what the type two error rate is for the COVID-19 test. So no one knows what the false negatives are. Hmm. So actually, for every test that we do, um, so let's say you had COVID-19, do a test, it comes back, right? And it comes back negative, right? Nobody knows what the rate of tests that will come back negative when you actually have the disease is, right? So actually saying I've done this many tests and this many are positive and this many are negative doesn't really help because we don't know what the errors are, okay? Mm. And the other thing we don't know is we don't know what the viral the viral load difference is between and what I mean by viral load is how much virus, how much active virus do you have to have in your body before you can pass a test positive? Mm. Right? Versus how much viral load you have in your body that you require before you can give me COVID-19. And because we don't know that, and we just we, we don't know because we don't know. You know, we haven't worked it out yet. Um, it's it's relatively new. We just haven't done we haven't done the work. So it could be pos it could be possible for you to have enough viral load to infect me, but still score negative on a test. That's a very dangerous or, error right there. Or the other way around. Yeah. It's also possible for you to have a nice enough viral load when I actually ram a swab down the back of your throat and scrape the cells on the back of your throat. It might be possible for me to get enough viral load there for it to come back positive, but actually there's there's no way to get that. There's not enough of it down there for you to infect me with it. Right. So therefore, it's, it's not a problem. Now we don't know what those things are. So that's yeah. why that's that's what I mean when I say testing is soft evidence. Yeah, and that type uh, two error, that uh, those false yeah. negatives are dangerous, very dangerous, because if I get that test back, I may alter my behavior. I'm good. I'm not infected. I just got tested this morning. I'm going to go out and mingle with grandma. Uh, exactly. So, so those are, you know, those are, those are, they're, they're dangerous things at the individual level. But when you try to abstract that out to statistical level, it's it's what I mean when I say that um, testing numbers are are soft evidence. Right. Okay. Because so they don't inherent really tell error you. In them. Yeah, they don't really tell you, but because of, because of the things that we don't know, right? They don't no, really I tell you. Error, say uncertainty then, inherent uncertainty then. Right, Ex exactly. We don't, you know, if the if the tests are going up or, or down, we don't, we don't really know because there's lots of things around the testing that we don't really understand right now. Mm. So that's soft evidence. Things which are hard evidence, things which will absolutely, excuse me, tell you whether the disease is becoming more prevalent or less prevalent is what I call then hard evidence. And mm. hard evidence is like, what is the hard number of, of 999 calls or 911 as you would say in the US? What is the hard number of 999 calls that the emergency services are getting related to COVID? Mm. You know, my, my granny woke up with the flu this morning and now she's barely conscious this afternoon. I think she might have COVID, please send an ambulance, mm. right? Those are hard numbers. Right. If they are increasing, chances, you know, that's hard evidence that the prevalence is increasing. If the prevalence is decreasing, you know, the sorry, the number of those types of calls is decreasing. That's hard evidence that the prevalence is decreasing. Another kind of hard evidence is how many people are being admitted to hospital with COVID-19 symptoms. Right. What is the admission rate? Because that's that's a hard, that is a number that we know. There's no uncertainty about that, right? That guy's either in a bed or he's not. Right. And if that guy is in the bed with COVID-19 symptoms, right, that is a hard number. Right. Not that there's no uncertainty there. Right. You pull back the curtains. There he is. There, there's no uncertainty. So those are hard evidence about um, where where the, the prevalence is going and whether it's it's getting bigger or smaller. And of course, you can use that locally as well to kind of I'm all getting back again, bringing it back full circle to, to William Farr. It's all getting back to this idea of providing evidence 
for local health people to be able to say we need to lock down this local community versus we can remove the lockdown from this local community right now. Okay. Because that's cause if and why that's important is because if we have a second wave, that's what we're going to have to do because the economy is not going to survive another six or seven month lockdown hard on the heels of the first one. And people say, I, I often hear people saying on the on the TV and in interviews and st and things like that, and they'll say, well, obviously, you know, saving life is preferable to protecting the economy. And of course it is, right? If that was the choice. But there's the there's the the famous work, and I should have, you know, if I was a sensible person and I knew I was going to go on to this topic, I would have looked up the statistic. But there's a statistic in the um, and you can probably you could look it up and put it in the show notes. But there is a there's an economic statistic that says for every percentage point that unemployment rises in the US, deaths rise by 10,000 or something like that, right? I mean, you can check those numbers and we'll put them in the show notes for the for the listeners so you can check for yourself. But what that shows, what, whatever those numbers are, and I just can't remember them off the top of my head. What that shows is protecting the economy versus protecting life isn't an either or, right? What you have to do is you have to say, well, actually, we can trash the economy um, and these people will die, but we'll save lots more because lots more people will die from COVID-19. Or we can kind of manage it where we can reduce the number of deaths on both sides, but it isn't an either or. It's not trash the economy and save everyone, right? Because as I said, for every percentage point unemployment goes up, 10,000 or whatever it is, more people, more people die in the US. So there is a, a health risk to trashing the economy and that has to be managed as well and so the way to manage that is to lock down locally where you need to and keep the rest of the economy going and then so financially support these locked down communities um, when they have to stay locked down with the rest of your economy which is which is still functioning and what enables us to do that is the medical statistics created by William Farr. Good so this is uh you've, you've taken this numbers apply them to um, what the government can do, basically what society can do to make right. this uh, less painful, this whole pandemic less painful. What can individuals do given this data? How can we better cope with a pandemic if we understand the data better? What, well, what they can do is, 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 is firstly make better decisions. I mean, that, that's what data science is, is all about. It's the right. same for everybody in every walk of life, no matter what it is I'm doing. It doesn't matter whether I'm working for Heinz trying to decide the best price to for, for beans or whether I'm working right now as I am with the, with the Highways England and trying to do flood detection, right? Mm. It, doesn't, it doesn't matter. What we're doing is we are getting people to make better evidence, uh, make better decisions. And that's where the understanding comes in, you know, the difference between data and separating the information from the data. And it's back to the to the analogy we made earlier on. If you think that the, the mortality rate or if you know that the mortality rate globally for COVID-19 is 3.5 percent, you may. You may make one set of decisions, but if you understand that it's 3.5 percent in av for in average and actually grandma might have as much if she has other what they call comorbidity um, markers, you know, other things that you will have died of, like obesity, type 2 diabetes, these kind of things, which are high in the list of things that people who die of COVID-19 also have. That's why it's called comorbidity. Mm. Um, if she has a lot of those markers, then, you know, the, the chance of her dying is much, much higher. Right. right? So you will take, you won't just go with that 3.5% risk in your head, right? You'll go, that's the average, but what's it going to be like for grandma, right? And when you understand that as an individual, you'll make better decisions. And then because you as an individual have made better decisions, when we collectively um, make better decisions, then society as a whole makes better decisions and we come out of the pandemic faster, healthier, with less dead people, which has got to be a good thing. I like it. Um, we're just about at time. Is there anything else you want to add before we sign off? And no, I think that pretty much pretty much covers it for me, Dave. I'm sorry you didn't get um, a word in edgeways. We really wasn't. I'm not sorry about that yeah. at all. I enjoy <laughs> hearing you talk, Gary. It's always good to see you, my friend. Yeah, good to see you too, Dave. Yeah. All right, you stay safe, sir. You too. You too, mate. And I'll talk to you soon.
remember in this time of COVID-19, we may be locked down, but what will keep us sane is technology and friends.